Lady Hawk is a 1985 film directed by Richard Donner. Of films he directed that year, I'm sure this other film probably sticks out more in the public consciousness. Goonies never say die, except all the times in the movie they scream that they're going to die. No! I'm too young! No! I want to play the violin! Anyway. It was still pretty early in his film career, but Donner was coming off the success of The Omen, Superman, Superman 2, which was uncredited is kind of a long story, and the insanely awesome Richard Pryor movie, The Toy. Seriously, go watch that movie. The main writing credit belongs to Sam Elliott impersonator Edward Kamara. He's also an actor and starred in a 2009 Western called Outlaw Justice. This is literally the only photo I can find to prove this is even real. It's hard to look up because there was another 1999 film called Outlaw Justice where legends of the country music scene like Chris Christopherson, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Travis... What? Wait, what the hell was I talking about? Oh yeah, Hawkwoman. Seriously, when I was a kid, as this was my mother's favorite movie of pretty much ever, when I was old enough to watch it, it became one of my favorite movies too. It's been over 20 years since I'd last seen it, but thanks to a recommendation to review it from Scott Kurtz, I jumped right in. So the question is, does it still hold up after all these years? Hyperbolic shaking I think it's kind of mostly sort of does. Caveat, asterisk, subtext, line straddle, hedge words. In the 80s, Hollywood went crazy with this awesome trend of one-off fantasy movies like Dragon Slayer, Excalibur, Beastmaster, Conan, The Sword and the Sorcerer, Princess Bride, Willow, Kroll, Legend, Deathstalker, and Xanadu. I'm not really sure where I'd rank this movie on that list of behemoths. Uh, for sure higher than Xanadu. Xanadu. Let's just get the major negative of the movie out of the way first. Like other movies in the 80s, in lieu of a traditional score, this film has a synth soundtrack that sounds like Alan Parsons threw up in it. Cause he did! Unlike Blade Runner, where the dated sound of the music ends up adding to the charm of the film, here it feels completely out of place. Filthy strumpets! Shoot, I think the filmmakers must have felt it too because mysteriously, real composed music from an actual orchestra shows up seemingly out of nowhere more than halfway through the film. Finally saving us from... Oh, never mind, Parsons came. Uh, other than the music and what appears to be the cinematographer discovering that color gel gradients can be placed over a lens, this movie is fantastic. It's everything a modern movie isn't. It's slow, character-focused, and small in scope. The design of this movie is awesome awesome. Even the hero's sword is awesome. It has a backstory where all of his ancestors added a gem to the sword and the empty spot is still his to fill in. You know where this setup is leading because the bad guy is always making people kiss his ring like the creepy badass warlock Grandma Tark look dude that he is. Kind of weird looking. I know. Don't look at me. Look at the floor. Thank you. Matthew Broderick plays Philippe, a thief who escapes from prison in the first scene of the movie. Uh, <clears throat> it's not unlike escaping mother's womb. God, what a memory. Look at me, Lord. Oh, and he talks to God constantly to not so thinly imply that Philippe might be, yeah, you know, corn nuts. On the run, he comes across the path of Navarre, played by a potato. Oh, no, sorry. I'm now being told that the character is actually uh, played by Rudger Hauer. Hauer. That night, he runs into Isabel, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. As it turns out, Navarre and Isabeau were cursed by Captain Shitdick, so during the day, Isabeau is a hawk, and at night, Navarre is a wolf. This puts Philippe right in the middle of it. Good thing he's a crazy person. Their journey is to reach the bishop and get him to break the curse, which they can't do if they kill him, which is a rule for them right up until they kill him. On their way to reach him, there's a lot of talking in enclosed spaces, and most of the movie's weight is pulled from these scenes. There's a lot of talking in this movie. But that's what makes this movie good. We get to watch these characters actually develop relationships uh, over the course of their journey, which movies just don't do anymore. Hello? Who do you think's out there? You'd better draw your sword, Pierre. Ah, Louis, you brought your crossbow. We'll all go back to the barn now, all right? All right, all right. Also, don't forget to walk on the left side. Walk 
on the left side. That's what I just said. Like, when did we stop doing small personal stories with our fantasy like this? I mean, did Lord of the Rings just ruin it forever and that's it? There's a few skirmishes in this movie, usually just a few people at a time, but all of them matter to the characters in the story. Instead of watching Legolas fire 10,000 arrows into blurry CGI who gives a shits, this one arrow that hits the hawk is enough to make everyone in the audience gasp. I, I said you gasped. <gasps> thank you, thank you. Thank you, is better. Okay, so to break the curse, they must appear before the bishop together in human form. So there's a solar eclipse, and the bishop very luckily doesn't, you know, close his eyes while it happens, so the curse is broken. And then there's this scene, which I think is the most powerful scene in the movie, where Isabeau walks up to the bishop holding her leather bands and throws them on the floor. No words. The scene gives me chills still. It's so good. Oh, and before they go into the cathedral, Navarre tells his friend Imperius that he's going into the cathedral and he's going to kill the bishop, that he and Michelle Pfeiffer can ever be in human form at the same time. Despite this scene where at the break of dawn, they're totally in human form for like 20 whole seconds. And that happens every day. How would you, why would you not know this, you dummy? What's way worse, and it makes me look at this movie very differently than I did as a child. Navarre the Potato tells Imperius to euthanize the hawk when he hears the bell signaling the death of the bishop. Yeah, maybe you should, I don't know, talk about that with the prior, it's not, I mean, it's not that bad. You spend 12 hours as an animal and 12 hours as a person, and we all go to sleep for like, Eight to ten hours a day, so it's not too far off, potato guy. But luckily, Imperius doesn't kill the bird based solely on hearing a bell that rings out like every day. So Imperius thinks Navarre is dead. Navarre thinks that he got Isabel uh, hawk murdered. And poor Marquette suffers the brunt of this Navarre ordered hawk euthanized rage. And they can have this crazy fight with like a million people looking on. And they're all like, I don't know what that last sound was. Sorry, that's not what a, that's not a sword. And the thing is, Marquette is the guy that accidentally solves this because he throws his helmet at Navarre and misses so badly that he knocks out the window a hundred feet above him. And this reveals the eclipse that saves them. Gee, thanks, Marquette, for saving all of it. Goodbye. And then Navarre, still pissed, is just going to kill the bishop just to bring the body count in the movie up. But Isabel walks in, and then Grand Moff Bishop sees them both. Boom! The curse is broken, and Navarre's all like, Oh, I'm an old softy. I totally came in here to murder your face off. But I changed my mind because I'm going to bang Michelle Pfeiffer right on the floor in view of all these people. He turns away, and the bishop's all like, Pfft. My staff doubles as a spear. Oops, you threw a sword through my chest. Goodbye. And then Navarre and Isabel uh, presumably bang right there on the floor because they haven't seen or touched each other in years. And then the people around are all like, should we like go or like leave these two some privacy? Because like I could stand to see a little more. I don't know about you, but like I could. I mean, if they're if they're okay with it, I mean, then, then I am as well. I don't have these puritanical restrictions about sex, you know, like all you guys do. Like I don't have those same ones. It's just this thing that people do. And if they want to bang in front of me and let me watch, it's like no big deal. You know, yeah, like totally, yeah, yeah. It's, I love HBO's Girls. It's really good. You should watch it in a thousand years when it comes on. Yeah, and then they walk out of the church. Navarre doesn't even grab the sword out of the bishop. So I guess that whole gem subplot will just have to wait for Lady Hawk 2. Philippe is a mouse now. Yeah.